as much out as you want. Okay. Um, so Dr. Barry Hibbs is a professor of hydrogeology within the Department of Geosciences and Environment here at Cal State LA. Um, he earned his uh, Bachelor of Science in Geology at Arizona State University in 1986 and a Master's of Science in Hydrogeology at the University of Nebraska Lincoln in 1989. And his received his PhD in Hydrogeology from the University of Texas Austin in 1993. He was then employed as a research hydrogeologist at the Texas Bureau of Economic Geology and Texas Water Development Board from 1993 to 1997 before coming to Cal State LA in 1998. Um, Dr. Hibbs' expertise is in hydrogeology and hydrochemistry of groundwater basins and terrestrial watersheds. Um, here at Cal State LA, he has developed over 3.4 million of external funding as a principal investigator and another 5.5 million as an external funding of external funding as a co-PI. Um, he had supervised 42 master students or master of science students um, theses. Um, and he had six, uh, 63% of these were Latinx, African-American and Pacific Islanders. Uh, he has also supervised 11 diverse undergraduate students in year long research. Most of his graduate and undergraduate students uh, that have been mentored by Dr. Hibbs has gone on to publish their research uh, as first and secondary authors on over 200 conference abstracts, journal papers, and book cha chapters. Nearly all of Dr. Hibbs' students are now gainfully employed in the hydrogeology industry or are enrolled in Master of Science and PhD programs. Um, Dr. Hibbs had the honor to be elected as a fellow of a Ge Geological Science of America and um, side in part on his basis of mentoring students. And he is the co-recipient of Cal State LA's 2014 Outstanding Professor Award. So we are all very honored to have Dr. Um, Barry Hibbs give a talk today um, on uh, forgive me, I'm blanking on the title, but I'll oh. let Dr. Hibbs tell us what he will be talking about. But we are very honored to have his expertise because these are two fields that are very interesting and I'm sure we can learn a great deal from him. So thank you, Dr. Hibbs. Thank you. And uh, someone should remind me not to put those dates in like 1980. <laughs> And if uh, some people know I'm a collector of memorabilia, and I notice you can see this phone here, a student the other day asked me if that was the phone I used in my household when I was a kid. So yeah, I think for sure those dates will be omitted next time. But thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and open up the presentation and hope there's no technical problems. Can we see that? Yes. Great. So yes, so um, we did have a presentation. Uh, one of Choi's students who's in the environmental history group holds an internship with tree people. And we heard from another kind of a joint presentation from tree people. Actually, we're meeting with tree people this afternoon. And they had talked a, a bit about some of the issues with respect to the retrofits of the urban environment uh, and the, the, as it relates to the hydrological cycle. So I thought that I would uh, take and combine a few different talks that I've given at various times and, and give a talk to this group today, kind of mixing, um, you know, technical issues and policy, but this, and then also my own research uh, and that of my students. But uh, the title, uh, Julian, is just showing, so you can you can read it there, and it's you know real pleasure to be here and share that with you folks today. I think um, it would probably be best if we paused questions till the end. But if there are any that you feel, you know, you really have to get in there, I, I do not object if you if we you ask and and then we uh, take a question in the middle of the presentation. Uh, most people are somewhat familiar with the history of 
some of our channels in the Los Angeles basin, in particular one that's of great interest is the LA River, which had been a prominent source of water supply in the 1800s. Um, so as the city was growing in the late 1800s and in, into the early 1900s, there started to be also a lot of groundwater development and installation of water wells, which then with the pumping of those wells um, induced infiltration from the LA River and captured other water that normally would flow into the LA River. So the LA River was drying up seasonally in some cases for months at a time. So it was no longer really a major source of water to the Los Angeles metropolitan area, other sources of water had to be found. Of course, um, LA River Aqueduct by Mulholland was, the, you know, I think that was around 1913 was an important source of water to LA. Later, the Colorado River Aqueduct bringing Colorado River water to Los Angeles. And then later after that, Bay Delta Project bringing water to us from the Sacramento uh, San Joaquin Delta in Northern California. So as far as a water supply, LA River kind of became an afterthought as, as a water supply. Um, it, it was unlined in, until an event in 1938 where there was an enormous flood that took out a lot of bridges, a lot of structures, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that flood killed 96 people. And so right after that, the Army Corps of Engineers drew up plans because of these torrential floods that would occur periodically to develop a flood control infrastructure. And that included lining of the LA River and some of the tributaries into it. And, and throughout the Los Angeles Basin, there was lining of many of these channels uh, that began really at that time. And I think through the 1940s, the lining was uh, being, being, um, being done. And it took about 20 years to do all of it. Most of the latter lining was done in the San Fernando Valley. But you can see, you know, some of the construction shown here from some historical archives to show in lining of the Los Angeles River. And so this just kind of lays out that the LA River has its headwaters in the San Fernando Valley. This is the Los Angeles River Basin. Uh, we're, we're not gonna focus too much on that, but the LA River, which, which is lined across most of it, its extent, has kind of this curve that occurs at the Glendale Narrows, where the channel is actually unlined. There's so much rising groundwater here, they just weren't able to line the channel there except on its sides. But then most of the channel remains unlined throughout most of its extent, except as you get to its discharge points into the Pacific Ocean. I wanna kind of um, show a little bit of history and since we're in Los Angeles and have a little bit of fun, uh, uh, kind of uh, chronicling Hollywood's love affair with the LA River. It's really quick, but it kind of then I will segue that into how I got involved in research on line channels and online channels in the Los Angeles area. So one of the first films in the Los Angeles River was this very well-known film. It actually won the Academy Award for Best Film in 1930 and Best Director in 1930, All Quiet on the Western Front. And I believe this was below the Glendale Narrows, these battle scenes, these are French soldiers running through uh, no man's land in World War II. It's still regarded today as some of the best, you know, film footage without special effects uh, in history. So, so it's a good film. Um, later, there was, after the channel was lined, one of the first films was Them, 1954. And this followed some of the thermonuclear detonations, atomic bombs, when a lot of movies came out about spiders and scorpions, and in this case, ants that became mutants as a result of exposure to radiation. So in this particular film, um, these ants were irradiated 
in the New Mexican desert and they flew to the Los Angeles area, took up habitat and some of the storm drains in the channel. And here you see James Whitmore and James Arness, two, you know, when they were pretty young, two pretty well-known actors. Uh, there, they, there was a, some kids playing in the channel here and they disappeared and they figured they were in some of the concrete line underground channels that because the, they found some, some of their toys and such right at the output of the channel. And so these soldiers went into the channel and James Whitmore being attacked by one of these mutant ants here. And then as we moved into the 60s and 70s, here's Lee Marvin in a very violent film in the LA River shown here called Point Blank. The Gumball Rally, there's a lot of, you know, kind of uh, vehicle chase and action type films that uh, were filmed in the LA River. And I don't think anyone can, can forget uh, this film, Terminator. And while this isn't the LA River, I believe it's one of the tributaries to it, 1991. And then in the 1990s through 2000s, a lot of films were continuing to be filmed in some of the line channels, such as the LA River. Uh, the theme of these were, you know, not really a lot of nice things happening in these channels, kind of scary places. And that was the same going all the way back to that war film, you know, a lot of violence, a lot of, you know, crime type films. And that image kind of has stuck today in these line channels. You know, not really great places to be, kind of scary. You know, some kid over here kicks his football and it goes into the channel and he goes and talks to his dad and, and dad says, Johnny, we'll buy another football, forget about it. So, you know, the question is why would I want and get my students and, and I be involved in studies in these channels? And so there's a kind of a real quick short story to that. Uh, that will help you to understand why we do a lot of research. And you'll see in this, in this presentation today, I hope that I can convince you that it's research that has been carried out to great effect. But, um, you know, I went off after my bachelor's to Nebraska, where there's a lot of farmers, you know, real kind of extremely friendly people. And, you know, so I had a master's thesis in a rural area. And I used to knock on doors at some of these ranches and farms and ask if I could sample their water wells because I'm a groundwater hydrologist. And uh, these people would not only let you sample their wells, they would bring you into their house, get out the picture albums, feed you a meal. And you'd be saying, I got to get out of here and get this work done. But you know, you could always sample the wells if you wanted to in Nebraska. And then I went to Texas, uh, where people are maybe a little more prickly and suspicious, particularly of you know of government officials, especially federal government. So asking to sample water wells there for my PhD and some other work that I did there. Usually you could do it as long as you didn't work for the federal government. So, you know, I was able to do research, you know, pretty much during the early part of my career without too many problems. Because these are a lot of these are private wells or wells that belong to water districts, what have you. Then I came to Los Angeles in the late 1990s. And what do we know about Los, about uh, California? It's a, it's a very regulatory heavy state. Uh, lots of litigation, and so I remember trying to get a project going and asking to sample a water well that was owned by a water purveyor, and it, it was, well, yeah, you can do that, but first give us $2 million of liability insurance, produce that, and then come talk to our board and explain what it is you want to do. People are afraid you're going to find contaminants and then point the finger at them. And so essentially, you know, I spent six months to try to get access to a single water well when usually I got a couple of wells sampled every day. And so I was in this dilemma, what the heck am I going to do? So this is where I found research opportunities in these line channels, as we will discuss today. And I've been doing it ever since, and, and I think to pretty 
to great effect. Here are a couple of students trying to look all fashionable, a couple of my students from years ago trying to look all fashionable in a line channel. Um, but uh, yeah, we have been carrying out a lot of work for many years, and, and we're gonna we're gonna describe you know the types of research that we did, and then some of the policy issues uh, with respect to line and online channels, and then issues of removing lining for you know trying to restore streams more to their natural state. I want to mention that all of the discussion today is for dry weather conditions, which is most of the season. We know that uh, you know a lot of work is done on flows in these channels in the storm season because of pollutant loading and discharge to the ocean. But um, for this presentation, it's all dry weather conditions. And it's for conditions where we have what we call gaining streams, meaning that the water table is above the channel grade and groundwater seeps into these channels. And we, as we will see, that happens even though they're lined very readily. And we'll explain that in, in just a bit. So keep that in mind. These are the conditions uh, that the, the, the presentation focuses on. Um, by the way, can you hear me? I, I, is it OK, good. So the objectives, uh, topic one is going to be to summarize investigations and in concrete line channels that provided a new conceptual model on stream aquifer systems that really, you know, that was the first study that, that produced a lot of subsequent research funding for me and a lot of student research. Then we're going to talk about access points where you can get groundwater in these concrete line channels as it discharges into the channels, and what are the ramifications of the loading of groundwater to these channels. Then we want to compare water quality between lined and unlined channels, look at some differences, and then kind of discuss the ramifications of that. And then finally, discuss technical issues that are related to stream restoration which is something everyone wants to do, but there are technical impediments to doing it. So it's not like we just go in and remove the lining and everything's gonna be great. So that's what we're gonna try and do here today. And I tried to design this, as I say, taking into account the audience, with very different disciplines uh, to where there is technical information, but you know, trying to make that at a level that is, um, understandable to a very broad audience and also introduce other policy issues related to that. So I'm going to start with this first topic, an eye-open selenium study, where this one first part of the study, an El Medina concrete line channel, actually led to about $800,000 in research funding as a result of a discovery that came as, from this investigation. And it's selenium focused here, but there are other you know, parameters here. We're talking about selenium. So what is selenium? If you look at a, a vitamin, um, vitamin pills, you'll certainly see selenium there along with chromium, copper, zinc. You know, there are these trace elements that are vital nutrients in, in diets of animals. And um, you can even, you might even see selenium in uh, a, you know, a cereal box in some of them. But we know like um, things like chromium and zinc that at higher levels than what's optimal for health, the, these trace elements can become toxic. And they're particularly harmful to migratory waterfowl due to bioaccumulation in higher trophic levels in the food cycle. This means that the, the algae will get some selenium, then insects will eat the algae, and, and then the fish, and then the birds, and it accumulates and it magnifies in the food chain. And it causes uh, undesirable effects like poor egg hatch rates, thin egg shells, and birth defects in migratory waterfowl. Also, uh, at high levels, it can cause these kinds of uh, deformities in fish. And now the EPA interim standard passed in 1987 for natural waters is five parts per billion, um, five parts of selenium, 
in a billion parts of water, essentially. It's been somewhat modified. It's actually more stringent now, but they also, the EPA recommends site-specific criteria be developed for any watershed based on the investigations where it can be either less than or greater than five. But I want you to remember five as kind of a target, target value. Now, the first study when I got here was a watershed study in San Diego Creek, which is located in Orange County, California. And UC Irvine is right here. It's a very beautiful area. Upper Newport Bay is the receiving point of discharge in the terrestrial watershed. Uh, you've got San Diego Creek and Peters Canyon Wash that drain the watershed. And although this is a protected ecological preserve, Upper Newport Bay, one of the last remaining uh, estuaries, the bays that has not been drained in Southern California, um, there is a lot of nitrate and selenium that th this watershed has been noted for getting into Upper Newport Bay uh, that created concern. And so a nonprofit group gave me a, like a $25,000 study to carry out an investigation to try to find out where this nitrate and selenium is coming from. And so this is El Medina Channel showing right here, which we're going to focus on. It is a line channel. So one of the first things I did was walk all of these channels. And this is El Medina Channel here. You can see it is line. And as I was walking along El Medina Channel, I saw all of these little flows coming out of these PVC pipes, you know, continuous flows. And I thought, what the heck is that? Is that like a coming from a garage or an industry where there's some, you know, some watering or runoff? Or is it groundwater? I knew it was possibly groundwater. But, you know, I hadn't done any studies in line channels at the time. And so, you know, did a little research and I found that they install these things into the channels. Because if they didn't, the groundwater would, would build up behind the channel and it would put a pressure on the channel, which then would crack the channel and break it down, which you can see is happening here. But uh, without these installed, there would be much more groundwater accumulation and pressure and they wouldn't last as long. So these are called weed poles and you can use them to collect groundwater samples. But they also, if the groundwater is contaminated, it carries contaminated groundwater into the channel. Now this is El Medina Channel again, and notice there's this dashed line here. I'm just gonna say that's a boundary we'll talk about in a minute. But along El Medina Channel, there were all these sampling points of weep holes. There was also a shallow bounded water well here. It was very shallow, it was put in during construction of a jamboree underpass here. There was a lot of shallow groundwater, so they had to do a geotechnical study to look at the groundwater and actually had to put in a dewatering operation during construction. And so this water well was left behind. And that study showed that groundwater was moving in this direction. So we want to look at the sampling results at these particular points along the groundwater flow path and then see what this line represents. So this shows some uh, parameters, just common uh, groundwater parameters or water parameters, chloride, sulfate, and selenium. I've already described selenium. And looking at this channel, notice that in these points along the groundwater flow path, the chloride doesn't change too much. So chloride is a very soluble ion, and yet you can see from the red bars, it's not, it's not increasing that much. But if you look at the selenium and the sulfate, those are going up quite a bit as you move through this sort of boundary here that I've not yet described. So that was very significant to see that the sulfate and selenium go up and the nitrate not go up in the groundwater in terms of the concentration. So I, this is the same data just put on a, a little bit easier diagram to understand. So I'm taking each of these points, I'm taking the top of the map and the bottom of the map, and that's what this represents, distance from top of the map. This is that boundary I mentioned. And then you've got chloride and sulfate values here plotted in milligrams per liter or parts per million. 
and selenium, which is, you know, it's a, it's a trace element plotted in parts per billion. And you can see as you cross this boundary, the chloride goes up a little bit, but not much. But the selenium goes way, way up, and the sulfate goes way, way up. Now remember, this selenium goes into the watershed, and there it can, you know, there's unlined parts of the channel further downstream with a very active ecology and lots of species. So this was a very important. And this told me there was a geologic source of selenium. If you can get enrichment like this from simple evaporation and groundwater is very shallow groundwater, it sort of will wick up through the soils like in a candle wick and evaporate. But if that happens, the chloride will increase also. And since that didn't happen, that tells us there's a geologic source of the sulfate and selenium. That's what it was implied, you know, as a, as a hydrogeologist, I know that. So uh, I took a look at the pre-development history of this area and notice this feature here. Turns out, and this is El Medina Channel here, which enters this feature where that boundary was that we showed. This is called the historic Swamp of the Frogs Marsh, which existed in the Irvine area until the late 1800s. It was, and this is the same map. This is showing uh, the Swamp of the Frogs Marsh over the whole watershed in Orange County. You see the scale here, this is four miles here. So this across is six, seven miles across. And the whole Irvine area was this large marshy wetland that existed until the late 1800s. The locals at the time could hear this, could hear the uh, frogs and they called it Swamp of the Frogs. And the El Camino Real actually was right above it and people traveling this road would hear the frogs. That's how it got known as the Swamp of the Frogs Marsh. And so that obviously was drained and, you know, very high dollar real estate there now in the city of Irvine and Tustin, but that was a large marshy wetland until about 1880, 1890, when they started draining it. And by the way, this is the Tustin Marine Corps Air Station, which was constructed, I think, in the 1930s. It's now been closed in residential areas. Big blimp hangers there, if anyone knows this area. But obviously, it had to be drained to put that military base there. And there's a lot of really expensive real estate now in this Swamp of the Frogs Marsh. Now, how does that relate to the selenium and sulfur, sulfate that we say has a geologic source? Well, all of these rocks in the um, headwaters of the basin are ma marine rocks that uh, you know, have been uplifted and exposed and are known for containing trace elements like selenium and, and, and they contain also sulfur. And so what happens during rainstorms, you leach a little bit of the selenium and, and sulfur out of the rocks. And it then flows into, it flowed into the historic marsh for probably thousands of years. And, and the interesting thing about sulfate and selenium is what happens when it hits a reducing environment, that means anoxic oxygen deficient environment, is it will change form from a dissolved ion or dissolved constituent to a solid because it's it's what what it, what it undergoes is what we call a speciation process and you've heard i think of the rotten egg odor from marshes you know that's from sulfate being reduced to a gas and then it forms you know sort of complexes with metals like iron but anyway the point is that in these marshy environments selenium and sulfate will be converted into solids and will accumulate there and would have accumulated for thousands of years. We know that with some climate variability, the, the boundaries of this would have changed, but uh, you know, it definitely, you know, having that correlation said something, wow, you know, there's a geologic source and maybe this is it. Anyway, all of the selenium and sulfur was accumulating these sediments until it was drained in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that was done by trenching these drainage ditches across the surface of the marsh so that the water table drained. 
And, and so that in doing that now you have soils that are unsaturated and then they could put in the bases and the homes and all of that. And these drainage channels exist today, like, like even El Medina channel. Now, what has happened in the last hundred years up to the time I did my study is the fact that the marsh is gone, it's basically all of that organic matter is being, is being oxidized and it converted from a reducing uh, marshy type environment to an oxidizing environment. And the selenium and sulfur were converted back into a dissolved form. It's kind of through a leaching process and that's where the geologic source of the selenium and the sulfate comes from, you see? And so that, that there, that which was, you know, my finding, even our uh, colleagues at the level ones were patting me on the back and, and you know, giving me a lot of credit for that. So, so what that meant was, and by the way, um, this diagram shows all of these weep holes and springs and shallow groundwater water wells, and this is showing selenium. This is the historic marsh boundary. And you see the reds in the right in the middle of the marsh now, the groundwater is now greater than 75 there. And outside the boundaries, the selenium is much lower. So yeah, this, this discovery actually led to about $800,000 in research funding. So after that, it was like, man, I'm sold. These are, these, you know, there's a lot of um, potential in these studies. After that, it was all downhill, but that was a good, that was a really good finding. And so now I'm turning to topic two, where can you get, where is this groundwater going into these channels? So we've already seen the weep holes. Some of these are vertical and this student making some measurements here in a vertical weep hole. Some of them are on the sides of the channels. Uh, here's another weep hole and the groundwater flows all the time. A couple more weep holes, happy students collecting samples. Uh, this is inside one of those um, lined, or excuse me, underground channels where there were no weep holes, but there had been sort of a little bit of sinkage, and the groundwater is just just flowing out of this uh, this sort of damaged lining here. And remember, you know, there's a lot of times in groundwater. This is shallow groundwater. A anything that's in it's going into these channels, and then they go either to the ocean or into the unlined parts. And you know this is an important source of loading of pollutants in these watersheds. This is Lane Channel here. You can see it's a bit older, and you see the weep holes have uh, deteriorated, and the lining is deteriorated, and groundwater is seeping out. Uh, this channel would need to be replaced or, or relined pretty soon. This is a bridge piling. Um, and groundwater is just coming right up through it. You get your groundwater sample. Here's an underground drain and a student, there's a spring right out of it as, as this lined underground drain flows into an unlined channel, big spring right there being sampled. Uh, and also uh, we see these in these uh, lined storm drains. Uh, if the groundwater table is above the storm drain, it will put pressure on the storm drain. And while there are no weep holes in them, uh, at the jointing segments of the pipe, groundwater can seep out. And this can accumulate and be a significant amount of flow accumulating from all the groundwater seepage. In this case, you know, the water tables right up to almost the top of the storm drain and groundwater is just pouring out as this happy student uh, is showing us. And this is a this is inside another one of these underground channels, and oh, this is just flowing like if you had the shower on at your house. Unfortunately, it's not a video, but you can see it's wet. And over time, this calcium carbonate precipitate has built up uh, because of the degassing of carbon dioxide. So that's actually just you know calcite, a very beautiful deposit, you know, for a for an underground channel. And then here, here you see there's iron precipitating as the groundwater uh, flows out and manganese precipitating tells us something about the chemistry of the water behind the, the actual lining and groundwater spurting out here. 
In this case, uh, sometimes they have to put these groundwater dewatering operations behind these, uh, these uh, high rises because they have basements. And if they run into shallow groundwater, they'll put it, they'll install a big underground tank that will collect groundwater. And periodically they have to pump it out and they pump it into the channel. And this one, this is in Costa Mesa area. This comes out about 400 gallons a minute and it flows for about 10 minutes, shuts off for about 20 and then, and then goes for about 10 minutes again. The tank fills up with groundwater and there's a pump that just pumps it into the channel. So keep in mind, if you got you know nitrate, selenium, whatever, that's going in these channels. Today, they regulate these things, but if they were put in before certain laws were passed, they grandfathered them in. So that's a, that's a point source of, of these pollutants, potentially, if that groundwater has stuff you don't want in it. This here, notice these are weep poles. What is this bigger one here? Sometimes when there's a, you know, a shallow groundwater problem, when they're putting in a development, they'll run these pipes, larger diameter pipes, maybe 100 meters, 200 meters perpendicular to the channel and they're perforated pipes and they'll collect groundwater and then flow out. So that's what's happening here. And, that, and so they're passive dewatering systems. And the same here in this underground channel where you see flow maybe 30 gallons a minute coming out of you know, what, what is a permanent flow of groundwater from one of these pipes. I always wonder when I'm inside of these if some big ant's gonna come and chop me in half or something, but um, hadn't happened yet. Okay, so turning attention to, and, and incidentally, so for collecting groundwater samples, you know, obviously uh, you get your permits, you take the safety procedures, you've got your gas sensors, emergency breathing supply. I, I don't take students in these anymore, but I still go in them myself or take the appropriate safety measures you got permits it's a lot less than trying to get one well and we've done a lot of work with these okay now turning to topic three what are the water quality issues in lined and unlined channels so one thing we want to mention about an unlined channel is you've got a zone of where you have a stream bed and stream banks it's you know, it's sands, gravel, silts, clays, it's interstitial deposits that contain um, water, essentially groundwater. But this hyperreic zone, which is this porous media below and adjacent to a stream, is kind of a gray area between groundwater and surface water. There's a lot of mixing here. Uh, the, 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 the stream stage can go up and the surface water will go into the hyperreg zone, stream stage comes down, groundwater will go into the hyperreg zone and flow into the stream. And these things are very vital for supporting the ecology of the stream. There's a lot of organic material in them, a lot of microbes. There are benthic and subbenthic organisms, tree, uh, plant roots, they're really, really important to the ecology of the stream. For example, certain fish lay their eggs in the hyperreic zone and um, the gases from the stream water are what keep the eggs alive. So these are really, really important in stream ecology and they can actually help to remediate contaminants in, in contaminated systems. So biogeochemical processes and unlined channels, you've got these hyperreic zones, plant roots, vegetation, lots of carbon. Um, you know, these can do things like uh, with, when you have solutes or pollutants, there's vegetation uptake, nitrate reduction, trace element reduction and uptake, or con organic contaminant removal. So, you know, certainly from a biogeochemical point of view, these online channels are going to improve water quality significantly. Whereas when you have a line channel, you remove all of the hyperreic zone and so you remove all of its attendant processes that help to improve water quality. And so whatever's in the groundwater moves right through the lining into the stream. And that should convince you that this is clearly much better from a water quality an ecological point of view because of these conditions. 
So we can look at some of the phenomena in grout lined and, and natural channels. Uh, it's not always the case, but a lot of times shallow groundwater is oxidizing. We've already talked a little bit about oxidizing conditions. And um, when you have this move through grout, it stays oxidizing. It moves from an oxidizing groundwater into an oxidizing stream. And so that's going to, you know, that, that means that certain things will happen and not happen. Now, on the other hand, where you have a natural channel or restored channel with a vegetated unlined stream bed and stream banks and hyperreic zone, typically because of the organic matter, just like we saw in the swamp, these become suboxic or reducing. And so you get a condition where oxidizing groundwater can move through this reducing stream bed and then, into, and then it becomes oxidizing in the surface water because uh, dissolved oxygen in the atmosphere diffuses into the surface water, keeps it at pretty high um, oxidizing conditions. So let's explore what kinds of benefits you have in this scenario in a natural channel versus unlined. And we're gonna go up into Malibu Creek watershed in El Camino Real where my student, uh, Mike Harrison, uh, who won, I think the NSS Outstanding Graduate Student Award four, three or four years ago, did his study. And so this is Las Virginas Creek, which is a, is a main uh, creek in the Malibu Creek watershed. There's a little smaller creek called El Camino Real Creek. And I'm just gonna show you along El Camino Real Creek, we found some springs along natural channels and we found some weep holes along line segments of the channel where you know you get very, you got some line, some unlined along El Camino Real. And this is just the data where we have weep holes where the channels are lined, and then springs where the channels are unlined, where groundwater flows out into the creek. Now conductivity is basically just salinity here. So you see all the values are about the same, which means that it's, it implies the same groundwater at the various points. But here you see nitrate, this is nitrate and this is selenium, and this is manganese and this is iron. So look here in the line segments, you have much higher nitrate than in the unlined segments. And these values are in parts per million. And then selenium, which is parts per billion, you see the selenium is, is much higher than in the unlined parts. It's a very dramatic difference, isn't it? Whereas with manganese, you see in the line parts, it's very, very low, but very, very high. And these are in parts per billion too. So why do we get this different chemistry? Well, we can look at some reactions and you know, I know this is a little technical, but I'm gonna make it very simple. When you have nitrate that is reduced, it converts from nitrate, which can cause algal blooms. If you got too much of it, it's not good for a watershed, it's a nutrient. It can be denitrified and form nitrogen gas and just go into the atmosphere. So that would explain why nitrate in unlined channels is so low. It's flowing through the hyperreg zone where there's a lot of organic matter, it's denitrified and then it goes in the atmosphere, and then the stream, uh, the, the spring water minus the nitrate goes into the creek, and so you got much lower nitrate. Selenium, we've already talked about. Selenium is reduced in, in these reducing hyperreic zones, like we saw with Swamp of the Frogs Marsh. And it will at first it can be converted to a gas like nitrate, or it can be converted to a solid where it reacts with iron and precipitates. And those, those uh, processes explain why nitrate and selenium are very low in the springs issuing from the line, unlined springs. And so that's great. We remove selenium, we remove nitrate. That's what we want. Now let's look at the manganese and the iron, which are very, very high from the springs, very high. Um, what happens is you have a lot of manganese and iron that are in solid 
forms in the soils. So this is a solid manganese oxide. This is a solid iron hydroxide. When you have a lot of organic matter, the manganese is reduced to a soluble form. So that explains why you get all of this manganese. And the iron is reduced to a soluble form. That explains why you get all this iron. And it's, so you get a lot of manganese and iron in the hyperic zone. Then it flows into the stream where it's oxidizing and it precipitates right almost immediately. And so you'll see these iron stains and manganese stains. And so it, it doesn't persist in the water. It essentially precipitates. You get the, the mineral stain, but that's okay. It goes away. doesn't threaten the ecology. So, so it's all all right. So the point is, and hopefully you can see the benefits of unlined versus line channels with respect to things like nitrate and selenium, the, the, uh, the unlined is going to remove it in the hyperreic zone. And that's a good thing. So uh, just real quickly, before I get into stream restoration and, and depending on where we are with time, um, so these numbers need to be updated, but in our urban watersheds, we've, we've done a whole bunch of work. The students really love it. Here's a student, I was, you know, obviously many years ago, uh, but it's been pretty, pretty productive. I was, um, let's say, honored to be able to serve as a guest editor of a couple of issues, special issues of these journals. This one was on urban hydrology, and this is the student, you've seen pictures of her, sitting on a line channel, one of the Cal State LA students. You see the seepage of the weep holes, and this area here along the unlined channel has collapsed because of the groundwater seepage. It's kind of like quicksand. It makes it easier for the unlined my students too, Kathleen and Yola. Um, and they are, can you hear me? Because I'm getting a sign that says my internet's unstable. Can you still hear me? Okay, I might get cut off when this, this only happened once or twice before. Let's hope I, it doesn't. So last topic and talk about some issues of stream restoration. Uh, that's what everyone wants to do, right? They want to restore streams. Let's remove all the lining from the LA River and have a natural unlined channel. And so there are some various opportunities in some places, but we want to explore the technical issues that constrain our ability to do this. And, and let me know if you if you um, if I lose the connection. Really quickly, LA River, this is kind of a, just a simplistic diagram. It, in the upper part of the San Fernando Valley, most of the flows is from dry weather urban runoff and some groundwater seepage and tributaries coming in. Then there are flows contributed from our wastewater discharges. These are gonna be captured and spread about some of the landscapes more, but at this time, there's still quite a bit of wastewater discharge. As we go through the ground, uh, Glendale narrows along the unlined segment, we got a lot of this rising groundwater and continuing to the ocean. The, the width of this blue line means additional flow in the river. And then as you move uh, down through, uh, I guess, Downey area, those kinds of, those areas, um, you get the dry weather urban runoff and groundwater seepage. So this is for dry weather conditions here. And then we've talked about, you know, how you can get um, uh, dry weather urban runoff to coming in. We know that there's a lot of groundwater seepage, right, in some cases, so we've seen that. So, so you know, this is one thing we've also been um, able to show is how important the groundwater contribution is and in, in, in these line sections. Everyone thinks they're impervious, but such clearly they're not. Now, what are the issues? This is what everybody wants to do. They want to remove the lining and put in an unlined channel. Let's do that for the whole river. It sounds really great, but there are a couple of technical impediments. Let's first mention uh, how stream discharge, uh, the channel 
crooked route as much flow during storms uh, through the watersheds and out to the ocean as quickly as possible. And so in the design of these channels, and this is a very simple rectilinear channel, um, stream flow discharge is, is gonna be like, if you take a five gallon bucket and put a hose to the bucket, and in one minute, if the bucket fills up with the garden hose, five gallons, the discharge or the flow rate is five gallons in a minute. In a stream, we're talking about the volume rate of flow in a unit rate of time, just like five gallons a minute, we usually use cubic feet per second. And the way that's measured is simply take the stream width times the stream's depth times the velocity of the water, and that will give you a volume rate of flow. If you use units of feet and seconds, it's cubic feet per second. And you know this is very, very good in these very smooth concrete line channels. But in unlined channels, you get erosion, you get rocks, you got vegetation, and the veget and the velocity will slow down. Uh, the way we measure in a natural stream, they're not rectilinear like this. We make discrete measurements uh, at various points, and then we do incrementally add them up, the width, the depth, and the velocity. And that's a process known as stream gauging. Now, what happens if we remove the concrete lining? That normally will slow down the velocity by up to 50%. And what will be the ramifications of that? The ramifications are to have the same discharge. If you slow down the velocity, of it. Slow down the velocity, you have to double the cross-sectional area if the velocity decreases by 50%. And lining is going to do that. And clearly that's an issue because these channels are designed for like 100-year floods um, at their maximum. And so there are, you know, that means you got to expand the channel if you unline it to have the same discharge capacity. So that can be a problem. Everyone wants to do this. And the other thing is, as you uh, remove the lining, the channel can migrate through erosion. So there are some issues uh, with respect to removing the channel, the line channel. And a big one is this, that the velocity slows down. You have to widen the channel to get the same um, discharge maximum capacity. Now I want to look at some partial restorations. I'm almost done. I think I'm just about pushing the time, but this is uh, at Arroyo Seco, which is just below the Rose Bowl. And in this channel, they have a concrete line channel. The, this is a tributary to the LA River. And what they've done is they took the floodplain and they, they developed channels and they divert the dry weather flows into these constructed channels that are unlined and they planted vegetation along them. So during the dry weather flows, you basically divert the flows into these channels. It gives water to keep the vegetation growing. You see that the change from pre-development to development creates a very nice riparian area. There's a trail here, birds love it. And this is an alternative is the BFI mitigation. This is uh, the so-called suicide bridge. So that's one option to consider. And then you maintain the flood control benefits of the line channel. For this Medea Creek sectional stream restoration was done. This is a picture where a segment was lined. And here are my students. There's a weep hole here that, that's being sampled. But they wanted to take this little section and restore it, which was done as shown here. And so they removed the concrete lining, they, they revegetated it, they put in an unlined channel here. But what are the what are the ramifications of that? What are the costs? And I want to give this to you for kind of economics of scale. This is probably a distance that would be the same as from our library to the administration building. So it's a very short reach of stream. 
And to do this, it was two million dollars, mm -hmm. and even more. This is this is this is managed by the L.A. County Flood Control District. The city of Agora Hills that did this took liability for this removal of the flood control channel. So they have to do the maintenance, and if anything goes wrong, they are liable. So there are really significant costs in doing this. And so, you know, you need to be aware of this uh, to have that understanding, you know, I don't know how many students are with us today, but if you're going to be in policy, then certainly these sorts of issues are extremely relevant. And I'm just going to end here by mentioning, I hope that you've enjoyed the topics, but uh, certainly you got to be careful in these channels. You try, you don't want to, animals can be trapped and they can then respond uh, in ways that uh, trapped animals might respond and you got to use the right safety procedures. I think I might have gone over just a couple of minutes, but uh, I will end there and take any questions if, if there are any. Should I close the PowerPoint or leave it open? Well, Barry, thank you for a great talk. And I just want to say that the Dean is having internet problems. So she was in and out, in and out, and now she seems to have dropped. Um, yeah, and he, he just said, tell Barry thanks, got kicked off again. So I just wanted to- Yeah, my, I got two signals. We may have the same provider that said internet unstable. I'm glad it, it, I didn't get kicked off, but that's understandable. Well, anyway, uh, if there are any questions, uh, you know, otherwise, hope you enjoyed it. But for, for us in our lab, it's been very uh, profitable uh, and engaging work. We have questions. Stephen raised his hand, and then I have a question. Yeah. Should I close the image? The yeah, probably. Okay. All right. Oh, I have, I have three. I don't want to hog it, but <laughs> I'll start with the sh with the short one. Um, when you were look, showing us the information from that historic marsh with the fry, 